Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let's talk about Michael Cassidis for a moment and Omar Henry. Right, Omar Henry, as many know, recently passed from cancer. It's a tragedy on a whole host of levels. He was a very slick, very good fighter on his way up. He looked like he had a very bright future in the sport. And of course, that was cut short for health reasons. Right? However, Omar Henry's health problems may or may not have been related to the sport of boxing. I believe we're going to find out in a few days that Michael Cassidis's health problems, apparently it's some brain-related injury, may have been caused by the sport of boxing. Now, I believe we're embarking on a new road, not just in boxing, but in professional sports in general. Right now, apparently the technology allows people analyzing the brains of athletes including current athletes to actually uncover CTE chronic brain injury that puts the athlete at greater risk of post-career problems right much greater incidence of dementia Alzheimer's we're now finding out that Lou Gehrig's disease ALS might also be caused by trauma to the head Right, And so we're in now a zone we have not been in the past where we can actually look at CAT scans and actually see brain damage before the injury worsens. Right? Now, I'm not a doctor, at least not a medical doctor. And... Um, I can't read a medical chart, but I suspect what we're going to hear from Michael Cassidis when he holds a press conference is that he got a CAT scan or some other, you know, head examination and that his doctors determined that he was at increased risk of chronic brain injury if he continued fighting. Now, let me tell you how it used to be. When I was growing up in the 1970s, Two of the best fighters out there were Jerry Quarry and Muhammad Ali. Right? Now, Jerry Quarry, and it's interesting to note, was actually examined before he fought his last three fights. And apparently, during that examination, it was determined that Jerry Quarry was suffering from the early signs of dementia. My source for this information is the obituary for Jerry Quarry that was written up in Sports Illustrated. It's an eye-opener. And apparently Jerry Quarry back then had short-term memory loss and had deteriorated motor skills. This is before his last three fights. No one heard about it Jerry Quarry continued fighting. Jerry Quarry was dead at the age of 53, a victim of punch drunk syndrome. Let's talk about Ali. Thomas Hauser wrote a book that Ali, in being tested before the Larry Holmes fight, and let me just point out, I know a lot's been said about that Larry Holmes fight. If you were alive when that fight took place, you were a skeptic at the time of the fight. At the time of the fight, it was an outrage that the fight was taking place. Well, understand, before the fight, Muhammad Ali was extensively examined. And before the fight, it was determined that Muhammad Ali had a coordination problem. Think about it. Before the fight, there were concerns about Ali's slurred speech. 
the doctors literally reached the conclusion that Ali had a lazy voice, that Ali wasn't brain damaged because there were times when his speech was clear. Right? This was the rationale that went into Ali being allowed to fight the then unbeaten, much younger, heavyweight champion of the world who actually knew Ali because he used to be Ali's sparring partner. In other words, Larry Holmes, in fact, Holmes today, in interviews, says conclusively that he knew he could beat Muhammad Ali two years before he fought Ali because he had been in the ring with Ali and he knew exactly what Muhammad Ali could do. Right? Well, understand that as bad as the Larry Holmes Ali fight was, and understand too, there are other things going on in that fight. Ali was taking thyroid pills, if you could believe that. Right? And, of course, if you look at the fight, Ali curiously, and Ali lost a lot of weight before that fight, is not sweating in the fight. Right? He's lethargic. He's hardly doing anything. He's getting beaten up. He's not sweating. By the way, this fight didn't take place in the 40s or 50s. This was where boxing was with the biggest name in the sport in the early 1980s. We'll understand after that fight, Ali was extensively examined. He was given a clean bill of health. How that happened, who knows. He then hopped in the ring and actually fought Trevor Burbeck. He had his corner with him. Understand that when you examine the Ali story, you're going to find out that there were people around Ali who questioned Ali's health years earlier. Ferdy Pacheco, the fight doctor, was actually Ali's doctor. And he loved Ali. He had one of the best jobs in boxing, as you can imagine. You're in Ali's corner. You're going to all these great places, right? Zaire, Manila. You're getting red carpet treatment. You're with one of the most popular people in the world. You know, the 1970s, Ali was a very popular heavyweight champ. The heavyweight championship has a certain international cachet. Ali is on the extreme end of popular heavyweight champions, right? So you can imagine if you were in Ali's corner, if you were Ali's ring doctor, you were getting attention, you were getting adulation, you were literally ringside at the biggest fights of the era, right? The Rumble in the Jungle, you're there. The Thriller in Manila, you're there. In 1977, Ferdy Pacheco urged Ali to give it all up. This is before the Leon Spinks fight. He urged Ali to give it all up. He thought Ali's health was deteriorating. And understand, he would know because he was the doctor in Ali's corner. Well, to make a long story short, Pacheco and, uh, and Ali had their disagreement on the issue. Pacheco went on his way. Understand that the Larry Holmes fight doesn't take place for another four years, right? In other words, there were people questioning Ali's health from up close in his inner circle years earlier. Also, ESPN has an excellent film on the Larry Holmes Ali fight as part of its 30 for 30 uh, series. What you're gonna see on that film are people in Ali's inner circle on camera before the Holmes fight talking about Ali's slurred speech. That fight unfortunately went forward. Let's just say diplomatically that Ali's speech took a turn for the worse after the Larry Holmes and Trevor Burbeck fights. Well, now we are in a new day. 
where Michael Casitas, while training for a fight, he had a fight on the horizon. That's why he was getting a CAT scan. Apparently got some bad news from the doctor. He's taken it to heart. He has decided to end his career. He's about to tell all of us why we should listen. The sport is a very dangerous sport. Understand, if you've been following it long enough, I'm not in my 50s, I'm in my 40s. If you've been following it long enough, you've seen some tremendous fighters, some of the very best of their generation. One of the best fighters I ever saw in my life was Wilfred Benitez, great fighter, champion at 17 years old. And you've watched these guys literally fade into the background. Brain injury, problems, if they're lucky, they're still alive. If they're unlucky, then they're like Jerry Quarry and Jimmy Young. They're no longer with us. These are men, quite frankly, passing way too early. As I said before, Jerry Quarry died at 53, right? In his prime, this guy was a professional athlete. We're literally talking about just a 20, 25-year gap between his prime and his end. Right, so let's listen carefully to what Michael Cassidis has to say in a couple of days. Let's talk about Keith Thurman. Now, viewers here on YouTube have been carrying me. I'll make a video. In the video, I will say, you know what, I wish I had the video to this fight. Most recently, the Miguel Vasquez, Saul Alvarez video. And you'll be surprised how resourceful the viewers here on YouTube are in making things happen. I literally had someone send me a clip of the fight, and it was very interesting. Because that clip just convinced me more than ever that uh, I just cannot understand how Miguel Vasquez could ever lose to Saul Alvarez. In the clip... So Alvarez tries to get something going. Vasquez takes a step forward and effortlessly ties him up, right? Well, one of the films that I've always wanted to see, and this is boxing wonkish stuff, but it's the U.S. Olympic trials match between Demetrius Andrade, I believe is how he pronounces it. It's spelled Andrade, right? It's Demetrius Andrade. He's an unbeaten fighter right now, and he's with... Andre Ward's trainer, right, Virgil Hunter, the great Virgil Hunter, and he beat Keith Thurman. I'd love to see that film because both of these guys arguably are the future of boxing. Understand, as I make this video, as a pro, both guys are un beaten. Different styles. Andre is a slick fighter who literally moves around the ring, hits you, doesn't get hit. When Andre's on his game, if it's a 10-round fight, Andre will win 9 of the 10 rounds. Right? Andre is still young enough to be politically incorrect. So when they ask Andre about Saul Alvarez and others, he flatly says, he can't do the things I can do in the ring, right? If you don't know about Demetrius Andre, you need to find out. Right now, I can tell you whatever the rankings. Privately, Andre believes he is the best in his weight class, and he might be right. Let's talk about the man he beat at those U.S. Olympic trials, Keith Thurman. You know, punching power is a gift from God. The punchers. Think David Hay. Think Yorkies Gamboa. Right? Great punchers don't need a wind up. Right? They literally have heavy hands and built in leverage. Right? I believe great punching in part comes from really a lifetime of balance. 
right? Great punchers, just like home run hitters. The difference between a home run hitter and a singles hitter is that for whatever reason, the way the home run hitter follows through, he gets maximum leverage. Keith Thurman is one of the hardest punchers in the entire sport of boxing with both hands. More importantly, he knows he's one of the hardest punchers in boxing. His nickname is One Time. He'll tell you that why one time? Because all he has to do is hit you one time. I have a video somewhere on my channel page, it might be lower down, of Keith Thurman's early fights, early knockouts. He literally walks in the ring, walks up to the guy he's fighting, throws very short, very compact, very hard punches, and the guys here fighting hit the canvas as if they've been in car crashes. Right? He is a mid-range hooker with punching power to the extreme. Keith Thurman on his front foot is very, very hard to deal with. And understand, Keith Thurman, to me, seems to have a dominant left hand. His left hand is better than his right hand. That's just my opinion, right? And when Keith Thurman turns over the left hand and is able to hit you to the body, it's a show stopper, right? He fought a guy named Laura. And let's just say this is one of those rare times where he was on his back foot. It's an interesting fight. The other guy is the guy coming forward. Picture a mid-range hooker on his back foot. He eventually drops Laura. Understand that when Laura gets up, he starts talking to his corner. He walks over to his corner. He asks his corner to take out his mouthpiece. That's it for him. He had experienced enough. He didn't want to get hit by Keith Thurman again. One guy has gone the distance with Thurman. One. Understand even that guy got dropped in the seventh round, got up, held on for dear life, was able to go the distance. Thurman's trainer is one of the best in boxing, Dan Birmingham. You might recall his name. He was the longtime trainer of Winky Wright. He also has trained people like light heavyweight champion Chad Dawson. I know many are saying, who hasn't trained Chad Dawson? But the bottom line is Dan Birmingham has been a trainer of the year, just like Virgil Hunter. Understand that Keith Thurman is his masterpiece. Keith Thurman was hanging around that gym as a teenager. Keith Thurman has been in the ring with people like Winky Wright, world championship fighters, right? This is a young guy who literally was raised around championship boxing, right? Who had a male role model in his life who just happened to be one of the premier trainers in the sport. In other words, when you look at Keith Thurman, it's like looking at a Barry Bonds or a Ken Griffey Jr. These are guys who literally were around their sport. You know, Peyton Manning. These are guys who were around their sport as teenagers soaking in the nuances at the highest level. Now, I don't want to oversell Keith Thurman because the point of this video is that, in my opinion, he's fighting a better technician than him. Right? Technically... John Zavek, in my opinion, is a step above Keith Thurman, right? Keith Thurman is the young guy with the fastball. Thurman's version of boxing is to get in the ring, hit you a few times, watch you fall in front of him, move on to the next fight, right? The problem with being blessed with great power, whether it's David Hay, whether it's Yorkies Gamboa, whether it's Keith Thurman, is that these guys are so accustomed to having opponents fall in front of them, literally fall at their feet, that you'll notice 
with a Yorkie Scambor, especially later in fights, with a David Hay later in fights, you'll notice that there are certain survival skills that these guys haven't been forced to develop. Right? John Zavik has those survival skills. He's excellent defensively. It's a rabbit ear defense. He bends his body forward. His defense is so good, it allows him to be offensive. Since he's fighting a mid-range hooker, most of the punches are coming outside his rabbit ears. He's able to defend himself. He got beat by Andre Berto in a fight I thought that underdog Zavek had a real chance of winning. Berto has since been exposed, most recently by Robert Guerrero. But understand that Berto has a jab. Berto can split rabbit ears in a way that, in my opinion, Keith Thurman cannot. Right? There's no doubt about it. Keith Thurman is one of the brightest young lights in boxing. My advice to gamblers is to stay on the sidelines for this fight. Thurman, to date, has not been in the ring with a fighter whose style is going to give him as much trouble as Jan Zavik's style will. Right, Carlos Quintana, who Thurman beat, is a lot more open and moves around the ring more and is much more open for hooks than is Jan Zavik. Right, Zavik is one of these underrated older vets who quite frankly give young guys with big punches and a lot of bravado a lot of problems. Right? I'll just say this. I'm expecting Keith Thurman to have all kind of problems in this fight. I agree that Thurman is heavy-handed and could literally end this fight on one punch. The problem is he might not be able to land that haymaker for several rounds. On his back foot, Thurman isn't as good as he is on his front foot. Anyone who knows Jan Zavik understands Zavik's accustomed to being on his front foot. Even against an Andre Berto, you're going to see Zavik is bringing the fight to Berto. Right? If Zavik gets Keith Thurman backing up, Keith Thurman's only going to be 60% of himself. Right? Thurman's going to be trying to land that left to the body. Zavik defenses his body. So I think this is a tough fight. If you're betting hard-earned money, my advice is to look at some of the other fights on the horizon. They're much better betting plays than this one. This is a must-see fight, though, because if Keith Thurman wins this fight, let's just say the sky's the limit for him, right? We may well down the road one day see the rematch between Demetrius Andrade and Keith Thurman, right? Because apparently this amateur fight is one of those urban legends. Right? Between two guys who right now look like they're about to take over boxing. But make no mistake, this is a stiff test for Thurman because he's a mid-range hooker fighting a guy who defenses hooks very well and who's going to come forward and who has a history of going the distance in tough fights. I view Zavik Thurman as a toss-up, right? Understand, too, Thurman has only gone the distance once. There's always uncertainty when a young fighter gets pushed by a veteran who is much more familiar with going the distance than the young fighter is and who's going to force the young fighter to fight at a fast pace. That's what Zavik is going to do. Let's also recall... The Berto fight ended because Zavik was cut up, right? Zavik normally doesn't cut in fights. 
if Zavik isn't cut, if there's no reason to end the fight, and if Zavik's bringing it to Thurman, who knows what's going to happen? I don't know. So, I believe this fight's too close to call. I would stay on the sideline. Of all the fights out there, this is one of the must-see fights you have to see. Let me just point out, too, that Keith Thurman is one of the premier punchers in the entire sport. If you don't know about him, you need to look at this fight. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Thanks for watching.